Welcome to Let's Get Writing. I'm your host, Katherine Taylor, and we're coming to you live from Grand Falls, Windsor, Newfoundland. And please do let us know from where you are watching, because it's always fun to see how far a video on Facebook or YouTube can travel. And today we've got such a great story. This, this show, if you're not familiar with it, is all about the process of writing and how we find ideas, how we create books, how we become inspired. And I like to talk to people and find out what their journey in writing has been. And my guest today, Dr. Don Hodder, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure. For the second time, actually. For the second time. For the second time. Well, Dr. Hodder was a family physician for 45 years. And after he retired, he decided to become an author. Amongst other things, you're an incredible volunteer in our community. And you've been very active in so many ways. Uh, bringing so much to the community from Kiwanis to, gosh, I don't know, you you know it all. <laughs> I've been with the Kiwanis for 45 yeah. years, uh, 40 years, actually. For, no, 45 years with Kiwanis, yes. And um, with the music festival. And the proceeds from my first book went to a charity, some of it to the music festival, some of it to the uh, Southern Central Health Foundation and the Salvation Army. And actually, in, in actual fact, you told me that you donated how much? Six thousand dollars. Six thousand dollars. Thank you, you sold very a lot much. Of books, you know. Yeah. So that's pretty phenomenal, and not everybody does that. Mostly, we're trying to make our money back from creating a book. It's not. It's not easy. But that's just an example of the way you've supported our community. And amazing. Thank you. Well, uh, one of the things about. Uh, publishing or printing or writing a book is that the author probably gets the least amount of money from that book. Usually it's the retailer, or the publisher, the, the um, people who do the, 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 the um, uh, what do you call it? Where are you? Uh, I'm losing a word here now. Let me help you. Marketing. Marketing. I was going to say that. <laughs> I'm 82 years old, and sometimes I lose a word. You're 82 years young, Dr. Don. You're amazing what, what you've done. I mean, after a full lifetime of, of working in medicine, and prior to that, you were a teacher. I've had a really good, interesting, challenging, and really fulfilling life. Yeah. And I think that came out when you chose the title for your first book, Follow Your Bliss. Follow Your Bliss is a, is a phrase that I stole, actually, from a, an author that I read a lot of. Uh, this was uh, John Joseph Campbell, uh, who's an American writer. He was a, um, a, uh, a professor of comparative religion. And comparative religion is one of the things that has interested me for most of my life. And one of the phrases he used with his students was, find out, if you can, what turns your crank? Mm -hmm. What would you like to do? What is your uh, thing in life you'd like most of all? And use the phrase, follow your bliss. Bliss is extreme happiness. So if you do that, find it, you will be a happy person. Yeah, simple words and I think very true. I've always said it to my children, follow what it is that inspires you. And I've tried to do it myself, thus here we are doing this show because writing and all about books is definitely bliss for me. But as it's so interesting because I read in this book, your second book, which is called Leftover Stew, I read about how you did like to study comparative uh, religion. So, yeah. And I was like, okay, not something that I've studied. <laughs> uh, no. Well, uh, you see, we were all brought up in Newfoundland, or Airport, Newfoundland. I grew up in a small community in the South Coast. Of fewer than 400 people went to a one-room school and uh, and um, we had at the time I was long left home before we had electricity we had no running water we had no indoor bathrooms and all this kind of stuff wood stoves and it was very primitive actually when you compare to what we got today we had no town uh, services we had no library and um, we had very few books to read except for the school books uh, if I go back a bit further, um, when I was about 10 or 12 years old, the, you're all familiar with the uh, 
Newfoundland Herald, which comes out mm -hmm. every week. Well, the, pre the predecessor that was the New the Sunday Herald, and they had a page for ki for kids, and you could write things in, you could uh, draw things, and so on. So I wrote a little poem when I was 10, 10 years old. So this is a patriotic little poem for of John Cabot discovering Newfoundland, and they published it. So I was first published when I was about 10 or 12 years old. So this has been a lifelong passion. <laughs> the other thing I had published in a church uh, magazine when I was about 20, I wrote a poem for my mother on Mother's Day. And that's in my first book. Because so there's a few poems in this book that you wrote as you were going along, too. Yes. Your daughter, I think, was one. Yes. Was there, yeah. There were... And uh, so that was a poem about my mother on Mother's Day. And they've actually published that. And the last, and the other things that I published in, uh, in uh, Reader's Digest, mm -hmm. a little story that's in the book also, about how we wanted to get uh, new windows in our house. And um, uh, it had to do with uh, the abbreviations. And so I've been using abbreviations all my life, right? Mm -hmm. and people come, people don't go for an electrocardiograph, they go for an EKG, right? Right. But they don't have electroencephalogram, they have a EEG. Uh, so uh, when the, when the uh, guys who were going to do the windows sent me a proposal, they said R, capital R, capital O, capital T, extra. So I said, now what is that? So I thought it was some kind of a retrofit tax, right? Okay. So I phoned the guy and he said, well, you know, in older houses, uh, Sometimes when we take the old windows out, uh, we find rot. If we that's our old tea, right? If we find rot, it's going to cost you extra. <laughs> so, so anyway, I thought this was so funny. I sent it out to Reader's Digest, and they actually published it in 1997, I think it was, right around there. And they actually sent me 200 bucks. Oh. So stupidity has its rewards. <laughs> well, it was a pretty cute story, actually. That's, I think that's in the first book. Yeah, yeah I, I haven't. I read the first book when we had our first interview, and I, that's, I spent, three year, that's three years ago. That was three years ago in mm -hmm. 2017. So if you want to see that, you can actually go back on YouTube, and it is it is there on my YouTube channel at Catherine Taylor TV. And then now we're catching up with the the new book. But I want to just go back for a minute because when I was reading in here, and you were telling about leaving for university, I think it was in. Uh, 58? 55. 55? But you were like, like going from a community that had, like your father had built a house in 52 and had not even built a bathroom or a space for a bathroom in it. So I'm writing this and I'm like, why? Why were people living like this? Well, the people lived like that forever. I and mean, that's uh, basically, if you, uh, one of the stories right here is about cleanliness. Yes, yeah, washing your hands and all this yeah, kind of stuff. Whole, yeah. Well, I just finished watching a series on Brit uh, castles in Britain. And the story there about this duke who didn't believe in cleanliness. And his, uh, his people had to get him so drunk they didn't know what he was doing before they did him a wash every few months, right? Mm -hmm. So the concept of uh, washing your hands or having a bath or personal cleanliness was. Yeah, and it, it's hard to imagine. I mean, I grew up here in Grand Falls, Windsor, and we had a lot of things, I think, that were not available oh, yeah. um, because of the British influence and the way the whole town evolved. So I knew nothing of this. And when, So then after I read that, I, I went online and Googled, like, when did electricity come to? Marystown in 1960. <laughs> but it was so many other places before then. And yet oh, yes. people continued to live like that. And it made me think, why did they stay? Why did because they say that? That, that? that basically was the only life they knew. In some of these little communities, there were actually people who went in there, were born there, and in some cases lived their life there, and are died and buried there. Mm. Uh, we, for example, we had no communication with St. John's uh, except by uh, sailing boat until I was 12 years old. There was no, no way to get there by car. And yeah. very few people had cars. Yeah. There were a lot more motorboats in Marystown when I grew up than there were motor cars. And you know, it wasn't that long ago when you think, 
when you think back, it really wasn't that long ago. And the dramatic changes in where we are where we are now. It's a different it's just, world all together. Yeah, but you're you're keeping up with it with what you're doing. I was uh, 12 years old before we had our first radio. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, run by a big battery about the size of a shoebox. Just being honest. Just yeah. Yeah. I'll talk about that in, in the first book. And you know, the, the thing about it, when you think it, we were isolated in many parts of Newfoundland anyway, and if you look at the size of the island, and then the size of the small communities, dependent on fisheries mostly at that time, maybe logging, was the railway through by then? See, the railway, the railway didn't touch us at all. At all. We, we were 100, 100 miles south of the railway. Right. I never saw a railway, never saw the railway until I left home when I was 15 years old to go teaching. So at that, 15. That's another story. Yeah, because I looked at that. I was trying to figure out your tra trajectory. So I went back. You graduated for, from at the age of 15. And you were teaching, and that was exactly the question. Was he teaching at the age of 15? Well, I was, <laughs> because basically I was too young to go to university to learn how to teach, so they sent me teaching. Now, there's a quandary for you. Mm -hmm. But I went down to Birchie Bay in Notre Dame Bay. Uh, on the, uh, came up to, to uh, Goobies, got the train, went to Lewisport, got the coastal boat, landed in Birchie Bay in the middle of the night, no wharf there to climb down and get down on, so I had to climb on over in a rope ladder. It's in the book. In a rope ladder in the middle of the night in the dark, we get a port of a dory, and we rode ashore. And that's where I stayed from the fall until the next June. And we had no telephones. I couldn't phone home to my mother and say, I'm here to write her a letter. Which got, we got the mail once a week. We've come some distance in the last 60, 65 years. It's unbelievable, really, really mm. think of it. But look at the distance that you came. Let's just go back to you. I mean, you came from a community like that, which is just a perfect example of how it really doesn't matter where you come from. It's what's inside you, because look where you went. And then what did it feel like when you landed at Dalhousie? That was, what What year was that, 1964? I, I have had a wonderful life, and you know, I give some of the credit, a lot of the credit, actually, to my grade 11 teacher. I was the only, only person in grade 11. So sometimes when I'm uh, with my friends, I say, thank you for coming back to my school reunion, because we're all here. <laughs> so we're all here, and that's uh, 60, well, that was in 54, so that's 60 years, 68 years ago. Yeah. Anyway, my teacher... When I started grade 11, I was 14 years old, and my teacher was 16. She had just finished grade 11 the year before. She was a really smart girl. And uh, I give her the credit for getting me through because we all had the same exams. I wrote the same exams as the kids from St. John's, the kids from Corner Brook, the kids from Grand Falls. And you either passed or failed. Right. There was a standard, what you call it, matriculation standard. No one in my school had ever met this treatment, had ever matriculated grade 11 before. The school was there for 50 years and they had one graduate. Why? Wow. I've been so lucky. I have been just blessed. I think, I think there's a bit of gray matter up there too between those two heirs, Dr. Don. Uh, and I think your desire to learn and to, to do things, because of the, these projects that you took on, which are very interesting and I guess some of the reason why what we're here to talk about are books, but I can't resist, I can't, I can't take it out of context of where you came from and, and how you evolved, because that's the incredible part of these books, the stories in there. And it's, we talked about how this in a way was somewhat of a legacy project. Absolutely. Yes. A legacy project, basically, you take the long view. I say to myself, you know, I had three grandkids. Eventually, they will have grandkids, and so on down the line. In 100 years or 200 years from now, this book will still be available, and they will go back and say, what a great life. Mm -hmm. you know, he had his severe challenges, because no one in his family had ever graduated from school before. No one had ever gone to university before. And certainly no one had ever I've actually, I was the very first one in the community of what is now Mary's town. 
uh, at the time, uh, Marystown was uh, was separate from Creston. Creston south of the river, grew up a little community on its own. Certainly going to lose for you these little communities that mm -hmm. are now all part of Twinity, right? Um, anyway, um, so um, it was just a, a magical thing for me. I just feel that I don't know. I just feel blessed. Yeah. So blessed. Yeah, and 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 you must have a lot of initiative and desire to accomplish things to go from where you came from to be where you are today. One of the things I say uh, is in the first book is that uh, I was a teacher, a preacher, a carpenter, a healer of the sick, the sad, and the lonely, and a comforter, but I never walked on water. Mm. <laughs> Always something to, to aspire to. <laughs> Let me know when that happens, I'll be there. <laughs> So let's go back to your books. The first one, and that's not uh, now. If people want this, that's as an ebook, I believe. It's a, it's still available as a hardcover, softcover, and ebook at thefrizenpress.com or at uh, Amazon.ca okay. forward slash books. All right. it's still there. I checked it a few days ago. Excellent. So anyone interested in that part of the history, and it is similar. It is almost like a. It's, it's a time capsule. It just really... Well, it is, actually. It is a time it capsule. Is, it tells yeah. my story, but in telling my story, I'm telling the story of... I'm telling my I'm telling the story of what happened in Newfoundland over the past uh, 80 years. Yeah. And especially as affected rural Newfoundland. And then the story about the uh, the plumbing. You said the picture was in here. <laughs> the one... The, the outhouse over the wharf that eventually became a doghouse. Yes. Yes. We do, that's in the book. That's, that's in this right, book, no, but no, the story is in this book here. Now, the second book, basically, this is called Leftover Stew, and I got the idea. This is like a, a culinary metaphor. Yeah. I I, this. I started out here in my first book by saying, you know, thank you for coming to my table of memories, right? Mm -hmm. With, With it. its bowls of blessings, platters of pleasantries, casseroles of kindness, Ladles of laughter, tureens of trouble and tribulations, even its dishes of dissertation and discussion, all seasoned with sips of sorrow and silliness. There's a lot of alliteration in there. A lot of alliteration, yes. <laughs> but it was a recipe. It was. Yeah. That, that's, that's a metaphor. And with this one here, basically the idea is, you know, in life, uh, you, you, you sometimes cook a meal and you have more left over, you have a lot left over, so that's good for the next day. So in doing this book, the publisher said you got too much information, but it's going to be too big. Mm -hmm. So I left over stuff. So this is stuff that was left over, plus other stuff I've written since, right? So I said, oh, it's like a bowl of leftover stew, and there's your bowl of leftover and there's, stew. And I'll tell you, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, he's written a recipe book. Wonder why he's writing a recipe book, <laughs> and then of course. Strange <laughs> enough, strange enough, the very first story, and it tells the story of my sister Marie and myself. Oh yeah. When we were about ten and twelve years old, and our parents went out for a couple hours one night, and we were left alone, and of course we had no radio, we had no television, we had no books, so we had to entertain ourselves. So what did we do? We decided to bake a cake. As you would. As you would. As you would. So we had never baked it. Now we had no no electrical equipment to do this. We had to stir it up. But we often helped our mother stir this up. So we went to the pantry and we found stuff. And so we just put a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and like it, and some carnation milk. And uh, but you, we put in you two put in a lot of vinegar. We put a half a half a cup of vinegar, <laughs> two <laughs> tablespoonfuls of salt, and a whole lot of other stuff. Aunt Jemima's uh, yeah, pancake. pancake mix yeah. and uh, a little bit of flour. And, mayonnaise and your bit of salad dressing. Uh, well, I said mayonnaise and salad dressing were unknown to us at the time. Oh, it wasn't in there. So if, oh, we, yeah, if, yeah, we, if it had yeah. been, we would have put some of that in yeah. too. <laughs> anyway, we tried to bake it, and then we um, we baked it for a while in our, our wood wood burning stove. So we didn't know how to keep the heat proper, but. Anyway, we cooked it and put it in. It put it out on, on, a, on a sheet and cut it in two. Frankly, it tasted awful. Mm -hmm. We gave it to the cat, and the cat didn't like it either. And you're going to read what my sister said after 
She looked at the cat it's on the left hand page. On the left hand page, look, she observed the cat. Oh, look, okay. the cat is licking her her ass to get the taste of cake off her mouth. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, it is funny, and you have such a good sense of humor. But uh, that's a, a wonderful way to describe that it was not a very good tasting cake. So don't try that recipe. No, don't try that one. No, I've been known to make a few failures. But the nice thing about this, the stories are easy to read. They're short, but there's there are also slices of life. And, and what you said, you know, they were part of, I guess, this compilation that didn't that didn't quite make it. But they're certainly worthy in and of themselves. And there was one that I really liked. Well, I liked a lot of them, but I liked the one where you, you did that. Um, imagine if uh, a global village would be 100 people and how that would break down. I found that really interesting. Yes. <laughs> I, I stole a lot of this stuff or uh, researched it in various places. And the whole idea is imagine that you're in a village of 100 people, but they're distributed according to the world's population of 7 billion, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you're going to have a lot of very poor people. You're going to have a, very, a, lot, a lot of very uneducated people. You're going to have a lot of people who are struggling. And if you've got an education, for example, you're probably one of the two people in there with a degree. Mm. Uh, which, or, yeah. or whatever, right? which opened my eyes because I, I didn't, you know, even though we live in this world and we we live in this country, we tend not to always be aware of, of, of you know, how difficult it still is for so many people in the world. And that's what that, that story sent home to me. Like, what am I thinking? You, know? you mentioned about a water and sewer. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in 1870 something, the uh, British Medical Association was celebrating its 150th anniversary. And they did a survey of of their 200,000 or how many 100,000 of members they had. And during that 150 years, surgery had gone forward, uh, antibiotics had been discovered, uh, and uh, all kinds of things that was unknown 150 years before. And um, so they did a survey. And it was largely agreed that the most important thing that happened in that 150 years was clean drinking water, mm -hmm. and safe disposal of sewage. Mm -hmm. It saved more lives than all the antibiotics and all the surgery that's ever been done. And still, about three quarters of the people on Earth don't have that don't today. Have access, yeah. Yeah. It's, it makes you want to, you know, we all want to do something about it. It's just such a huge problem. But in a small way, you can do something. This, again, the sales from this book are also going to be they're going, they're, the sales from this book are going to the community food bank. To the community food bank. Central, Central Food Bank. Yeah, which is a very worthwhile endeavor as well. So, folks, um, if you're out there and you want a great read and you want to also help the food bank, this is how you can do it. And the books are available throughout the town. Are, and, and also, these are not, this one's not on Amazon, but, no. but, People can ask you directly, and we put a link, an email link below, and uh, on any of our promotion, people can click, and they'll be given an email directly to you where they can request the book, $20. $25, $20 to buy locally at a drugstore mm -hmm. here in town. $25, I will deliver them anywhere in Canada. And I've done so far to St. John's, to Vancouver, mm -hmm. to uh, Fort McMurray, down to Alabama, Texas, uh, so and all over Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. So twenty-five dollars, you ETF that, and give me your mailing address and so on. It'll be in the mail within twenty-four hours. You got that ETF thing going. You got the abbreviation thing down there. Electronic transfer. <laughs> Electronic <laughs> transfer, transfer funds. of funds. Of yes. funds. Anyone's not ETFing, um, but and and that's wonderful. And I'm sure if, if you get a request from down in the United States, perhaps you'll accommodate that. You'll figure out a price. So don't, no matter where you are, if you want this book, Dr. Donald Potter will get this book into your hands and you can enjoy a taste of Newfoundland and how life was and his thoughts, which are really, really interesting. You must read a lot and think a lot because there's so much in here. Like I was looking at when you were talking about the English language and 
and uh, that, that how how what word was it could be pronounced as fish according to you know and I'm going like what. What do you think about during the day? <laughs> see, that came from George Bernard Shaw, Shaw, who in his will left a legacy that a new, a new, uh, a new alphabet should be should be found, right? Because we got forty-two, I think it is, sounds in English, but we only got twenty-six letters to represent them. So O U G H, for example, mm -hmm. can be pronounced as cough, cough, tough, uh, through. Long. The seven different words, yeah. seven different pronunciations of O U G H. So if you've got G H O T I, G H, you pronounce it as F and fish. Uh, o U O as in women. Mm -hmm. Sounds like. And T I as in nation. You got F I. -ch. Anyway, read the book. Read the book. <laughs> I, I spent about five minutes working my way through those sounds, thinking like, yeah, it could it could be pronounced that way, but then I went back to. What was he thinking about? But you and George Bernard Shaw would have been buddies, I suspect. But there's so many, I mean, you can pick this up and there's so many things just to get you thinking. It's a very enjoyable read. In the short time that we've had, it's been hard to even fit in talking to you about the, your self-publishing journey and checking my, uh, on, my own, uh, on my own time clock here. We, we are... We are actually just about ready to wrap this one up. So maybe we'll come back and with part two. <laughs> we'll finish this interview and we'll do part two. And mm -hmm. we'll do another half hour and we'll find out more about that printing journey and some of the other things that you did. Does that sound good to you? Perfect. Sounds good to me. I'm not on any tight schedule, are you? No. All right. You get it. This is part one. So if you do have questions and you're watching this live, you can type them in and I actually will. We'll see them. I've got my phone here to double check that. So don't be afraid to do that. And we'll talk a little more about um, we'll talk a little more about this and uh, find out how these books came to be. In the meantime, thank you for joining. Let's get writing, and we appreciate your support. We hope you enjoy the show, and we hope you learn a little about what we're doing. And you can check out all the shows at youtube.com, Catherine Taylor TV, even that show from. 2017. That was one of my first shows. I didn't realize that. Yeah. I've yeah, got 70 shows, and you were one of the first ones. Well. Yeah. All right. Well, bye for now. Say goodbye, Dr. Dawn. Bye-bye. <laughs> See you later, alligator. And we'll be back in a few minutes with part two. Take care.